to Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. Parents, check ICDL.com under Courses for the upcoming course with floor time expert and music therapist, Dr. John Carpente, that I'll be facilitating on how to do floor time with music on May 11th at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Register at ICDL.com or under the Events tab at Affect Autism. Dr. Carpente will also be our DIR guest expert at the Parent Support Meeting on Monday, May 2nd, which you can also register for at ICDL.com under Parents or at the Events tab at Affect Autism. The Parent Support Drop-In is free. You can attend every week, and on May 2nd, you can find out more about the Floor Time and Music course that we'll be offering. Welcome back, listeners. I am Daria Brown, and this week I have Mary Beth Crawford, who is a licensed physical therapist and DIR floor time expert and training leader who founded Baby Steps Therapy in 2008. Mary Beth regularly provides lectures and in-service training to numerous parent groups and medical professionals and allied health groups on the foundations of motor development and on her unique approach to pediatric physical therapy. Welcome, Mary Beth. Hi, Daria. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's wonderful to have you on. You're my first physical therapist uh, floor time person. And this was a parent request that asked for a podcast about physical therapy and floor time. So I'm thrilled that you were available. And also, uh, we realized that we've actually met in person in New York City right before the shutdown at the, it was the ICDL slash Rebecca School DIR floor time conference. They had a happy hour across the street after the conference. And I remember meeting you. Yes, that was wonderful to meet you. Um, I had driven up from Philadelphia with several colleagues um, that I've worked with for many years. And, you know, that morning of March 6th, 2020, we were not sure we should be taking a train into Manhattan, you know, using lots of hand sanitizer. But, you know, we were determined to get to the Rebecca School Conference and, and see all of the speakers and and collaborate with like-minded professionals and that is where we met it was awesome yeah it was a wonderful conference and yeah we we had no idea what was coming that's for sure (laughs) and i also realized that i had recognized you from your picture on the board at a total approach maud larue's clinic in um, glenn mills pennsylvania where i've brought my son uh, numerous times and so um putting that picture together with the memory of meeting you and and realizing that because I, I I didn't remember any of that until we set up this podcast. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So Maud is just, I cannot say enough about Maud's mentoring me in my early physical therapy years. And I had the great fortune of working with Maud and, and really, being introduced to Dr. Greenspan's work and the floor time model. And at that time, you know, for me, the the way Maud's approach and the floor time approach gave the science to the instincts that I always had about relationship and individual differences and development. And um, yeah, I, I, I was just honored and, and it was a true blessing that I was able to work there and now be a part of um, the training leaders at ICDL and and bring it my really big lofty goal is to bring the floor time approach to more developmental pediatric physical therapists because physical therapy you know we have in floor time affect we have sensory and we have motor hey so all of those synchronously developing together we know from from the science is how kiddos truly truly make meaningful developmental gains and and optimize their motor development. So let's start out describing what is physical therapy and how is it different from occupational therapy? And I'll just, I'll start off by just saying that my son had physical therapy when he was quite young and then he was discharged. And in, and well, you know what? I'm gonna leave the example for later once you describe it more. Okay, sure. Yeah. I, you know, physical therapy is a very 
broad and incredible occupation and profession. Um, we, one has an undergraduate degree and now, you know, when I went to school for physical therapy, it was a master's degree that I think after, don't quote me on this, but I think, I think after 2000, the post baccalaureate degree became a doctorate degree in physical therapy. Um, so in the physical therapy content, um, physical therapists go through extensive training in the musculoskeletal system, the neuromotor system, uh, re respiratory. Um, we, as a part of our, our initial training, we shared cadavers at, um, with our medical students and, and had very rich and deep uh, neuro neuroscience background. Um, from there, as you go into your physical therapy content, <clears throat> among other, like other occupations, you can specialize um, and doing a lot of continuing ed coursework, whether someone as a PT can specialize in orthopedics or post-surgical acute care, which would be inpatient in a hospital. And for me, my heart, and I didn't know it when I went into PT school, it took a, an early um, kind of clinical rotation in pediatrics to know that my heart was really in pediatric physical therapy and development. Um, so that is one small subset of this really broad profession um, with the goal being to optimize any individual's um, function and, and activities of daily living. And, you know, for a kiddo, their, their functional outcomes really have to do with their play and their engagement and their ability to access everything around them in their environment. And so um, when I think about motor development in, in floor time and individual differences, the I, we talk about sometimes children that have challenges with motor planning, and that sort of falls under occupational therapy. So can you sort of talk about uh, to like the lay parent out there who doesn't know a lot about what occupational therapy is and uh, how, how are, what are the scopes of each and how do they overlap? Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's a question I get very frequently and it's very, very hard to parse out because the occupation of occupational therapy and, and the, the, um, specialization for a physical therapist in pediatrics, it, in my mind and in my approach, each of them really should take into account all of the individual differences of a child. Historically speaking, um, I think, you know, when I first came out of school and I started working in pediatrics, the occupational therapists in like a school-based setting or in a hospital would, would focus more on fine motor and the physical therapists would typically focus more on gross motor. However, that said, I work with a, just an incredible collaboration um, with a, an occupational therapist at my clinic. And she and I really feel like, you know, when you're looking at the whole child and the whole body, the OTs are looking at the core, they're looking at their postural control, they're looking at their motor development and the physical therapists can't, discount when the visual and the vestibular systems are impacting, you know, near point hand-eye coordination or so. So the answer to this question is there is a lot of overlap um, and the, the backgrounds and the trainings are slightly different. Um, I think in school right now, and, and this is kind of part of what led me down the floor time route, I think OT has some, a bit more background in um, an education in like developmental psychology, whereas the physical therapists in the curricula now in the universities um, have a stronger, and um, I am sure this could be wrong for certain, you know, certain places, but the, the gestalt is that, you know, the physical therapy looks more at those physical. And so that might be another area of, you know, a bit of a difference of scope. However, you know, when we're looking at pediatrics, you know, my my feeling in developmental motor, motor development is that, you know, as, as a physical therapist, we also really need to look at all the individual differences because if we're working on balance or we're working on strengthening core, you know, having an understanding of those individual differences is really paramount to how we're going to support a child to optimize their, their overall function. 
So that is why for me, I, I feel like a wonderful marriage between the floor time approach and, and physical, physical therapy. It overall is, is really what is um, where, where I would love for there to be, you know, more, more developmental PTs who, who kind of take an interest and, and I know there are more and more, um, which is wonderful because, you know, these, these kiddos have emotional, they, ha they need our affect they have individual differences and, and they can really go far in their motor development with, with an understanding and of how to support that. So I, I can think of a number of questions, but I'll start with my example uh, of my son. So my son at age two had quite severe brain inflammation that left him with a lot of brain damage, but he sort of popped out of it in, in a few weeks where he was sort of running again and, and doing things. But had um, lost speech and language. And then we got the autism diagnosis, which, you know, now, of course, looking back, I can see all the sensory issues that he had from birth and maybe the brain inflammation just exacerbated uh, some challenges for him. Um, but what they did in physical therapy was watched how he walked and how he moved. And of course he was little, he was very little. He was only, you know, two and a half and he was tippy toe walking all the time. So in my mind, I was thinking, okay, he's excited. He's, you know, up on his toes. And I asked around and I found out lots of kids tippy toe walk. Um, and what they had said is we need to keep his heels down because if he's always up on his toes, the, the um, lengthening or whatever in his calves you know, could he, his range of motion when he gets older could be a problem. So sure. we had these, I don't, I, I guess they're called orthotic, like boots kind sure. of things strapped on the lower part of his legs. And at the time he loved Curious George. So we put Curious mm -hmm. George picture on the back. So we called him his George boots and he would wear those. And those essentially forced his heels down. So now, of course, looking back with a floor time lens, I think, okay, um, and, and before I get there, I will say, okay, well, what I was going to say is forcing him to do something when his sensory needs him to come up. I, I don't like that looking back now, but what I will say is he also at that time had these little squeaky shoes. So every step squeak, 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 squeak. And when he wore those shoes, guess what? The heels came down because it was fun. And I thought, wouldn't it make more sense to have him in these shoes? that squeak and have him walk on the heels that way, then forcing him to wear this restrictive boots that force his heels down. But at the same time, you're listening to the specialists and you don't want the worst case scenario to happen. So I'm just curious, um, you know, from the PT perspective and then from the floor time perspective. No, this is a great question. And it's one that I, you know, being, being the floor timer, I think it, this is a situation where every child is a bit, is, is unique, right? And so um, what we would do, there's a wide variety of what impacts toe walking. And, and that is a great question because that is very often wh why someone like a, a pediatrician or an OT working with a kiddo might consider thinking about physical therapy. Uh, um, because classic sense of physical therapy says like, you know, let's look at the muscles, let's look at the flexibility and, and, you know, that part of, of our bodies is very, very important for many reasons. Um, when, when muscles get tight, it tethers our proprioceptors and can impact our body awareness. When muscles get tight and we go up on our toes, kiddos often don't get trunk rotation and, and, and it's more a function of their visual and vestibular systems working together and staying stable. Sometimes kiddos go up on their toes because they're in the heightened state of arousal, which we know about in floor time. We found, you know, FEDC1, taking in all the senses and staying regulated. Tiptoe is a hyper arousal, you know, kind of another, you know, taking in all the bits and pieces of everything can be hyperarousal, can be some musculoskeletal tightness. I often, often think that kiddos who have um, difficulty with their eyes working together, eye teaming, 
go up on their toes because the higher we are, the less our eyes have to converge. And, and kiddos might have a little bit of an ease on their ocular motor muscles if they're up on their toes. So there's a visual spatial component to toe walking. Okay, um, can we pause there for a second? Because sure, sure. that's really interesting. That's the first time I've heard that. And my son actually, right after we're done this podcast, is going to the developmental optometrist for a follow-up. And that's one of the things they referred us to many years ago. And he does have these glasses to make his eyes work together because he was suppressing vision in one eye. Right. And as he's been wearing these glasses for you know short periods throughout the day, the last visit, she said his eyes are now finally working together and she was thrilled. And through We Chose Play, the series that I, I've done about our experience with floor time um, in season one, one of the episodes was with occupational therapist Gretchen Kamke, and she pointed out throughout the early videos of my son how he is very visual. He loves watching things move. And that's always been such a, a prominent part of his profile. When he was a baby before the brain inflammation, at seven months old, he'd be staring out the window, watching flags blow in the wind and everywhere we went, he'd watch movement. So that is so interesting to me that nobody ever brought that uh, to my attention explicitly. And if Maud did, I forgot about it. So maybe Maud would be watching this and going, oh, Daria, we told you that at a total approach. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, yeah, no. Well, sometimes it takes a minute for every, there's a lot, it takes a minute. Well, what I'll say is by the time we went to Maud's clinic, he was yeah. no longer wearing the George boots. So mm -hmm. now I'm thinking early days before I met Maude, uh, we had never heard that. Right, right. Well, and then, you know, so for me, um, there is, I want to also address kind of what you were asking about um, from the musculoskeletal standpoint. There is, there, there is some value, I also think. And so this is where that clinical judgment piece comes in. Um, there are some kiddos who develop some orthopedic deformities from being really high, high up on their toes. And so there is there, it is worthwhile to consult with, you know, the, the physical therapist or an orthotist. And, and in our clinic, we get together if we really feel like that is something that we want to look at. And of course, you know, you would never force a child if they're, if they're upset, you, you, that is very counter to all of our intuition and development. Um, However, if a kiddo has the range of motion and really likes their, their George boots, there's some benefit to um, wearing them in the sense that when, when kiddos with individual differences with their visual and vestibular and proprioception, sometimes kids are on their toes to get that deep input. Um, what, if a child is like receptive and likes the feeling of coming down on their heels and having some kind of orthotics, because sometimes we get them to give really nice sensory input. What that does is it can feed forward into their central nervous system and get their visual and vestibular systems working a little bit more, kind of like the glasses that work to support convergence. So if a kiddo has when a child's walking up on their toes, they don't get what PTs like to call heel strike in the gait cycle. So when you don't get your heel strike, when you're up on your toes, you don't have rotation and that can impact bilateral integration and bilateral coordination. And, and that, that term that OTs really like to use, um, crossing midline, you know, all of those mm -hmm. things. And because that's scientific that we know that the, the brain and body need to cross the midline to support their motor planning, which is bringing us full circle back to the praxis piece. Um, these are all foundations. So sometimes with orthotics, when kids get heel strike, there's research that shows, and I can get you the reference that, um, you know, in the gate labs where the PTs are all watching, <laughs> how kiddos are walking, when a kid can get heel strike, the activation chain goes right up that trunk rotation and they get better better trunk rotation. The idea is that can feed forward and support their, their, their postural control. And, and hopefully over time, maybe even, and this is just my, my, my thought on this, maybe even some of their visual vestibular, um, just by way of maybe giving them that support. Um, but, but that would only be in a situation where there was, a, you know, some intentionality and understanding um, and, and obviously not a, a refusal or, you know, nothing, 
the biggest thing I feel as um, a PT is that I really feel like, you know, we want to support and not force because anything we're forcing just sets off that fight or flight. And um, that will prohibit any novel motor planning, any, any new motor learning will not happen if a child is not engaged and, and has that intent. So, you know, it goes full circle there. So I, I wanna pause here to speak to parents. So if you're listening and your child tippy toe walks and maybe you've had a referral and all of that, first of all, this example was only about my son and every child's different. So, you know, don't assume that what Mary Beth is saying is applicable to every single child. But what I will say is what you would do is if you find out, you know, it's beneficial to get these kinds of orthotics, the floor time way to approach it would be to figure out something that your child finds fun, something that they're interested in. My son loved Curious George. So we, the, the um, wonderful doctor at Holland Bloorview, um, you know, had Curious George image uh, that I had sent placed on the back of the boots, uh, orthotics, so that we could then, instead of being like, you have to wear these, blah, 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 it's more like, ooh, look at the George boots. Oh, I wanna wear, I want a pair, hey. And, and just not, really yeah. building up that anticipation and fun so the child wants to put them on. And, and even taking that further in our clinic, the kiddos pick out everything. They, <laughs> they, they design and they have that agency and they're engaged in the process of, I want blue, I want rocket ships, now I want a pink, you know, that giving them that um, initiative in any way we can support a child's own affect and motor intent is, is, would be the way to kind of support that. Yeah, for sure. And I'll just say that that is the key. So if anyone's listening says, okay, how do I do that? How do I do that? Well, this whole website, Affect Autism is all about doing floor time. So you just apply that in whatever vein we're talking about. The DIR is the umbrella term applied to all of these different disciplines. And so, yeah, just getting the child interested in um, and, and uh, motivated through like all of these different ways, like giving them agency, using lots of affect, uh, following their lead and in, in their interests. Mm -hmm. And understanding that, you know, that is the, the orthotics are support, but they're, they're meant to be used with a overall, you know, um, as a, just a part of what would be also taking into account all of the child's individual differences in all areas, um, you know, and, and that if there was a way to understand, is this more musculoskeletal? Is this more visual vestibular? Is this more visual spatial? And, you know, while, while using the orthotics, also supporting all of those things to kind of develop synchronously together would, would in my mind, be the optimal way to support that kiddo. Now, one thing they did whenever we went for our visit is the physical therapist would take his foot and stretch it back and see, could he do a 90 degree? And then she would measure and say, well, he still doesn't really have a full range of motion. So we still want to keep wearing them a little bit longer. And eventually he, you know, he was getting a better range of motion as he grew. And that was what they wanted to see. They wanted to see as he grew a few more inches, if that range of motion was tightening, that was a problem. So luckily it wasn't, but I'll ask you this. I was thinking, okay, he has the anatomy of my family, wide feet, high, um, arches. not arches, but the top part, uh, instep or whatever, okay. really high. So like, maybe it's just his anatomy that he can't lift the foot because the arch is so high. So I don't know if this is really a problem or if it's just proactively, you know, hoping to prevent anything that might happen. Mm -hmm. And so I always kind of, I went along with everything they said, but at the same time, I was never going to force him if he was screaming or anything like that. Um, it, it wasn't very fun trying to force him to sit there while she, you know, bent his foot back and he didn't like it, but it, it wasn't horrible either. We did the best we could and we got through it. Um, but 
I, I think maybe you can speak to that where maybe there are other parents going through that. And I should say that, you know, my son is now turning 13. He, I think it was maybe three, four years ago, he finally got discharged. We basically had a follow-up once a year where they watched him walk back and forth, watched him watch walk flat foot, uh, did the range of motion thing and said, you know, he seems to be, seems to be doing very well. If you have any other concerns, you can always call back and make another appointment. So he was discharged a few years ago, but they were just basically following up with that heel thing. That was kind of the only thing we were in PT for. Yeah. Okay. There's so much to comment on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm like, organize your brain. Um, I, the first thing, you know, and this is just my approach, my, what led me to seek out a total approach in mod and collaborate when I was very young in my twenties is a part of in, in part understanding that the relationship between the therapist and the child had to be paramount in development. The other piece was when I was kind of taught earlier in, in the physical therapy world, it, I worked with a lot of babies who had torticollis who were very tight or kids who had very tight heel cords or hamstrings. And um, I, I saw a, a lot of the crank on your little tiny baby neck, stretch it like, and a lot of the philosophy was like, we got to improve this range of motion um, for this kiddo, you know, to, to not have a one-sided strength weakness. And, and, and um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I'm like an empath and, and I'm sure Maude and all my colleagues will crack up because I can kind of, I can feel the feelings kind of in a heartbeat, right? Like, and I can emote and, and some of those little babies and the moms would be crying when, when you'd go into stretch and, you know, I didn't have kids yet. And I didn't, and I was like, you know, there's in my gut. And I, I probably didn't even put words to it, but I started doing more like my fascial release where, where there's just some pressure and some gentle, um, mobilizations. And, um, I remember this one time, this little, little baby, baby was so tight. And I started singing, you know, and the mom is crying and I'm like holding all this emo and I'm like, uh, like 23, maybe 25, but I started singing and, and, and sure enough, this little kiddos, I, I could get her all the way stretched when she was engaged and, and we were chilling out. And, and so I did a bit more research and, and I, I do not subscribe myself to stretching when a child is resisting even their neck or their heel cords, because all we're doing is strengthening the tight muscle. <laughs> so that, that is my kind of take on that, you know, and now sometimes easier said than done to get a child to relax and work on them. I found, um, my fascial release, um, to be really, really helpful. There's a pressure that you apply and, and the muscles due to your, it's a gentle, gentle, much more gentle way to mobilize and improve the flexibility in muscles. Now, sometimes that also is very challenging with our kiddos who are heightened and, and staying in perpetual motion. So, you know, my take is that you, you, you look at a kiddo and you understand all the individual differences. And then you know that when you start supporting one, the other ones all change because the brain and body is, is inextricably connected, those sensory emotions and motor. And, and so it, it just goes back to the same fundamental of FEDCs one and two and three and, and coming out of that heightened arousal. And, and, you know, there are ways to improve flexibility that, that don't cause hypervigilance or resistance, you know, in, in our practice. And, and sometimes they take a lot longer but I think that's much more fruitful than, you know, stressing a young kiddo system. So, so at, at the risk of um, repeating stuff that people already know and understood mm -hmm. to translate what Mary Beth said uh, for the parent world, the first three functional, emotional, developmental capacities, the FEDCs that we talk about in floor time, the first one being, you know, being regulated and be able to share attention and have interest in the world. The second one being able to engage and relate with somebody. And the third one being this back and forth, two-way purposeful communication through gestures, through whatever it is. Um, 
she is saying that, you know, if you're relaxed and the baby's relaxed, and let's just think about this, like how many of us have to go get vaccines when we had our COVID vaccine and are scared of needles? Like if the person comes, okay, sit there, hold your arm still. I'm coming with the needle right now. Like imagine you're all tense in that. What if they're, um, have you seen the, the video that went viral a year to a couple years ago of uh, the doctor with the baby and he's going doo, 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 with the needle and all around and the baby's oh, following right and he's there. like, doo, 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 boop, 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 and poking, 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 and the baby's smiling and la, 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 la. And then by the time he goes and injects it in the leg, the baby doesn't feel anything and everything's all fun. That's floor time. I'm going to try and find that video and put it on the blog post. Um, I so love that. Yeah, that's what we're talking it, about. That's what we're talking about. Instead of making the child all tense and scared and oh, I'm forcing the neck over like, of course, I'm stiffening up just thinking about it. Um, and, you know, just like I can think now as with my son, age 12, I would say, oh, we're pressing the gas on the Mario Kart. OK, break. And then, you know, we would use that to see how far he can get back. It's mm -hmm. just like, it takes a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. It takes Pacing. being slow. Mm -hmm. It takes intentionality and it takes being in the moment, attuning to the child. All of these things are the things we talk about every single podcast, the last podcast with Kashina. I hope you guys will listen to co-regulatory support. She was amazing in describing this whole process so that's that's what mary beth's talking about here and that's the best way to work with kids and that's why we like floor time for everything <laughs> it's true and the other piece that you were you kind of touched on it is that a lot of times when when families come to our clinic <clears throat> i'm really validating the like you said i didn't really like it it felt kind of uncomfortable and like that piece that's like yeah mom moms really know you know like moms can can very often when when we say as the expert like you know well what do you think trust your instincts on this like how does that feel and and how can we work together to think about this like you know that is who you who who you know i have three kids i want to work with someone who who says that to me because i live with these people you know like <laughs> So there's that piece too of like, you know, feeling comfortable to ask all your questions and, and really understand, you know, what, what we're, what are we doing here? You know, what's the goal and, and how do we get there while preserving joy? Cause it's possible. It is. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the thing that's been obvious in what we we're talking about that I didn't explicitly state was the R in DIR, the relationship. So forming that relationship, like you said, being comfortable with the parent, the parent trusts you, the child then trusts you, the child sees that the parent trusts you, is comfortable, and you spend that time at the beginning to, you know, you know like they don't come in and like, boom, you go right at it and the kid's you know, traumatized, you just, you know, you get in there, you're playful, you're having fun, you have that relationship you've built up with the therapist, and that makes it a lot easier too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right, for sure. So let's go back to what you said at the beginning, which was the foundations of development. So do you want to describe a bit about your approach and, and those foundations of motor development? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. When we're looking at gross motor in, throughout development, you know, we're looking at a, a kiddo who, a, a little tiny baby, I shouldn't even say a kiddo. One of the, one of the biggest early um, things we look at in, is, are those writing responses with kiddos when we kind of look to see, can a child hold their visual gaze on the, on the horizontal when we when we um, take them and, and, and displace their body. So one of the things that is a foundational reflexive response um, that then the, the child can develop mentally when they're on their bellies, they're lifting up and they're developing this prone extension control. And, and a lot of that has to do with their gaze and, and, and their movement sense in their inner ear, their vestibular system. Um, 
kiddos then start rolling and you know grabbing their toes and eating their feet and and um all of these early developmental things rolling and then up on their hands and knees and start crawling and when the cut baby is crawling they're looking down and looking up and and these foundations are building all of this information to the central nervous system and the little baby is learning about their sense of touch their hands they're they're gaining strength and stability and um, their ocular motor system is starting to fire and they can take in the vision. And um, oftentimes, you know, families will come to us and they're, they're we're very happy when we have little tiny babies because <laughs> then we can really start to support sensory and motor and affect from, the, from those early developmental stages. Sometimes we will get an older kiddo and, you know, the, the school-based PT is maybe working on catching and throwing or riding a bike. And, and you know, my, my feeling is those are great goals, but this does not mean that the child stands there and you just throw and catch a ball, you know, like this, this means you look and say, if I get on the floor, can, can, the, can this little this little friend roll the ball back and forth to me. Can we, can we look at the, this is the D, can we look at the developmental capacity for the motor and the affect and, and the signaling and all the things and take it to the foundation and start there and start scaffolding the skills from there. Um, oh, I love, I love that. Um, so you're saying just like, um, just like we talk about the D and floor time when you're coming in at too high of a developmental capacity, you're saying same thing, catching and throwing starts with first being able to roll a ball back and forth, doing that back and forth, um, noticing and engaging. And then the rolling might go into eventually like hitting a balloon back and forth because yes. it's slow and then you can see it. I remember people saying that because my son was a thrower. He threw everything. I thought, where, where are the scouts? Because this kid's going to get drafted. Like the arm on this kid was unreal, but he couldn't catch. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, they, I remember he was two years old and they had him on this little tricycle trying to force him to ride a bike. Well, he, I don't think he actually started pedaling a bike for another three, four or five years, but he eventually did. So mm -hmm. a lot of those kinds of skills were delayed in him. Mm -hmm. um, and you're saying, just like when I've had OTs on talk about fine motor uh, takes, you know, it starts with gross motor skills before you can do the fine motor writing. Right. And then the gross motor is dependent on the individual differences. And, and in our work, we, we do a lot to support a lot of times the gaze stability is kind of founded in that hyper arousal where the middle ear muscles are relaxed when we're in that relative state of fight or flight. And when our middle ear, inner ear, middle ear muscles are not, um, the vestibular system isn't registering that rotary movement, kind of like when we were little, we would roll down the hill and we would stand up and, and we would get dizzy, right? With, with a lot of our kiddos who stay in motion, they're trying to get more body awareness by staying in motion, getting enough registration of the movement then supports the, their gaze stability. I don't know if you had this experience with your son, but some kids who have visual, in, you know, individual differences with their visual system have better gaze stability when they're on a swing or on a ball versus kind of like standing on the ground because of that support of giving them more vestibular input kind of helps support that gaze for, um, for their ability. Then what, then what you see is the foundation is that the kiddo develops the reciprocity of affect cueing and emotional signaling because now they can see- While they're feet. moving. Yeah, now they can see, oh, you know, really hold that gaze. And, and, and so for us, you know, the goal is, of course, oftentimes working with the families and what, and what that child and what that parent's goals are for themselves. And, and we always hold that. And, and we always, in floor time, presume the highest, you know, outcomes for everybody. 
And the way to get there is to go, okay, let's work on the gaze stability. Let's work on registering movement. Let's work on all of those foundations. And, and then what we find is those functional outcomes come from that. You know, they, they, they beautifully flourish into when we work on the foundations, the higher, the higher capa um, capacities for their motor really come. Does that make sense? Did that make it, any sense? It does, it does. And it makes me think of another question that I can imagine parents of younger children have, which is um, children who walk late. So that tends to be something that we get asked when our children get diagnosed, like when did they start walking? Mm -hmm. um, so children will crawl and then they'll sort of creep and then they'll sort of stand and then, you know, do that patting their hand around the table, around the coffee table. That was my favorite. So cruising, cute. they're cruising. Yep. Yeah. And then, you know, and then the walking and my son did all of that at, at typical ages, but some kids don't. And then some kids, um, you know, uh, don't even crawl and then they just start walking like so. Is there anything to that or is that just vary across kids? When are you concerned with the walking, crawling? Yeah, so there, so, you know, being a developmental therapist, I, I, I think that's the, there's a lot of value to understanding, you know, when a child's older, whether they, they crawled or whether they scooted with one little leg um, up there. And, and a lot of times the crawling for me as a PT is, is much more of an important developmental stage than walking. And that's because crawling is very sensory based, tactile and gives a lot of proprioception and, and works on that visual vestibular system. Oftentimes when a, when a child is not crawling, um, you know, they have weakness in their core or in their proximal, their, their hips or their shoulders. Um, or a lot of times, it does go back to um, their their ocular motor and their visual system. And kids who use the one like scooting, it's more visually driven. That they, when they're when they're on hands and knees and looking up and down, their eyes aren't working well together. But if they're upright and their head is upright, then they can see things in their in their visual. So they're sort of compensating for yeah. So, so, so we're curious, right? Like so, we we approach these things with curiosity. Like, I wonder why this child what what is impacting this this little kiddo not going through you know the developmental stages and, and sort of like Dr. Greenspan believed that all kiddos go can go through all these social emotional developmental stages, you know we sort of approach motor development, like all of the motor, the motor development stages also can be supported. Um, and so from that standpoint, you know, we look at all of the, all of the areas for rolling and crawling and, you know, because sometimes kiddos were crawling and they, they didn't roll. And, and so one of the things is, you know, well, I'd be like, well, how can I be so great that we want to roll and then see what happens? You know, <laughs> how can we, you know, how can we really get more, um, you know, and sometimes the rolling and crawling is because a kiddo has a st hyper startle reflex. And then that goes back to um, trying to support just more affective cueing and calming the central nervous system. Um, and sometimes it's because there's tactile sensitivities and, and, and there's so many different things to consider for each individual kiddo. Um, and this is really where the team approach is so um, helpful with the floor time model and is that you get the input of the occupational therapist as well as Absolutely. all the other team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Col I mean, collaboration and communication is, is a hundred percent paramount to every child and family's journey for sure. So, yep. yeah. I remember one of my son's therapists saying that, and, and she was a self-proclaimed empath, like you said you were, <laughs> she would watch my son walk and she said, it really feels like his left leg is heavy. Mm. And he does sort of have this little kind of quirk in the way he walks. And then every now and then he'll sort of do this almost like little Pee Wee Herman adjustment kind of thing. And I brought it up in the podcast with Keith Landhair, the OT, and, 
And he just said it might just be a way of readjusting his sense of balance as he's walking. Um, but is then I remember I remembered that she that woman had said it looks like his left leg is heavy for him. Yeah, I would love to watch him walk um, and see. Well, sometimes the the jolt comes from hip, but sometimes it could be coming from his ankle, like his feet. I'm curious. There there would be a lot of things to kind of think about. Um, the, yeah, I mean, a lot of. It sounds like to me, it's probably a compensation for clearing his leg. You know, if it's just that one side and and what's going on. If if he did your son had some motor planning difficulties yep. um, Lots. Yep. developmentally. I, I think um, a lot of kiddos develop their own strategies from that. And, and, you know, once they have a motor plan that's working, that, that motor plan gets perpetuated. So this sounds like it might be something like that. Like, this is my motor plan now, you know? And, and so it might be something like that, that mm -hmm. I'm sure, for sure, because we think everything is intentional. It started to compensate for something. And now, you know, this is, this is my gate. Right, um, right. And I guess well, my, it, my question would be, unless it's causing him, you know, difficulty with his balance or, you know, tripping and falling, if those things were happening, then we would want to look deeper um, and see if that was impacting him. Do you think it's impacting him in any way? No. And you just reminded me that that was part of why we got discharged from physical therapy as well is because they said, do you notice him tripping and falling a lot? Do you notice him doing these things? And, and we didn't. So they said it, it didn't seem to be a problem. But one thing that I remember we did is, is when he was discharged from the hospital, when he was two and a half, we got this big bunk bed play structure thing mm -hmm. and although he never actually slept in it, he played on it all the time. So climbing up a ladder to the top bunk, sliding down. And I think that was really helpful for him because it helped him coordinate and be motivated to move. And I think, and we also brought him to this um, thing called movement where these uh, somatic practitioners would like do different like things where he would, you know, he would jump on the, the step and then jump down and jump up and jump down and jump up and then roll and then do flips and she'd have him do all these different movement things. So getting his body to move in all these different ways, I think probably helped his development a lot too. Whereas I think now he's mostly sitting and playing video games, which isn't great. <laughs> uh, no, you brought up, this was the, this was the other thing that I really wanted to thank you for bringing this up because I was going down a different rabbit hole, but like with, with the floor time approach to motor, you know, we've been talking a lot, which is, is so important and so valuable about how to become engaged and regulated and how the emotional um, and relationship piece impacts the sensory and then those things impact the motor. And what Daria is saying, which I so truly believe is that it can go the other way too. The more that kids can have movement and joyful fun running around, even if someone comes in like a Tasmanian devil and we put on their favorite music and start doing some coordinated movements, the movement piece or climbing up and sliding down, climbing up and sliding down, those sensory motor experiences and very rich flourishing movement can then also impact the sensory and the emotional regulation. And so it is like a really beautiful circle where as a physical therapist, it's like, you know, to your point, movement is so fundamental to even activating higher brain centers and, and activating a lot of things that our kiddos who come to us for support um, in, in these areas do really need to start with just getting up and moving, you know? So, so and it's easier said than done sometimes. I don't mean to say that, that lightly, but, but also sometimes it's not that hard to, turn on some music and get some movement going and, and really have fun together in movement. And that can create a space for more coordinated gross motor goals to happen. Um, I used to put on, it was funny cause I was, you know, in a, in, in, a, in, in another clinic I was sharing, I would turn on like, you know, just radio music. And, and some of the kids just loved it. And I was having so much fun. And, you know, 
from that, we would be able to sequence through obstacle courses we would never had we not had our dance party, you know? So the movement part of this triad of affect, sensory and movement really does have a strong impact on the other two prongs too. It goes both ways. So. Yeah, and and I think about how, you know, at my son's school, they try and do these dance movements and that, and he's not that interested, but when they say like, oh, we're doing the toad dance or the Mario this or the princess peach this, then it becomes more engaging and, right. and he'll do it. But just even for, for parents, I think I have a, a blog about floor time games and that like hide and seek, peekaboo, those kinds of things where you can run and do anticipation and be silly and hide and and then chase. And, you know, we would do that with my son. And even to this day, like he'll say, I'm here. Like he doesn't understand, like Aww. don't don't tell data yeah. where you're hiding, right. you know, like, but it's it, it's so cute. So we have to pretend that we don't know where he is. I wonder where. He, oh, I don't think he's in this room. I'm right here, <laughs> you know, but doing that chasing and being silly, like that's a way to get kids to move too. Yeah. And in the movement increases arousal. If there's a kiddo who, you know, we're trying to pull in, uh, um, into a, trying to woo, to be in a shared world with us. Um, you know, there's so many different ways. If, if the dance party is not the way there, there are, you know, bouncing on balls and five little monkeys. And there's so many, um, row, row, row. There's so many ways to kind of add movement. If the child's more interested in a specific topic, um, or a certain, you know, you, uh, definitely like Daria saying, try to find that interest. Yeah. And, and, um, the more, the more movement often, you know, sometimes with kiddos movement, can can be what we call dysregulating for some kiddos and so um you know what i like to say is that's an opportunity for growth right so so just because there's dysregulation from movement then we're curious but that doesn't mean we don't have movement because that movement is so valuable for all of our all of development so then you know you just have to attune and figure out how to scaffold how much movement and and that can be another great physical therapy goal is, you know, scaffolding how much movement we can get in while staying engaged and while working on building on some of the um, other foundations. In the same way you scaffold learning to catch a ball by starting with rolling and then maybe the balloon and that, that's sort of scaffolding as you go along. You start um, swinging in a blanket or, you know, there's other, there's lots of ways to very slowly titrate that up if that was something impacting, um, you know, somebody's gross motor or just overall gross or fine motor. Or and I'll, I'll refer people to the podcast with uh, Keith Lantair about um, sensory integration and co-regulation where, where he talks about doing that movement in the swing is not just about them swinging, it's about having that effective reciprocal interaction while they're swinging. Mm -hmm. And that was what Dr. Greenspan talked about too, that that was so important. So important, right, right? Because as Dr. Greenspan said, you know, <clears throat> kids don't reach for a bell, they reach for your face. You know, you can carry that to, all the fine motor and the gross motor, you know, back to the, that it just always back to the D and the I and the R, right? Even if your goal is to, um, you know, kick a ball into, you know, a lot of that is also, that's relationship based. And, and, and so, yeah. And, you know, speaking of the movement and, and some kids are overwhelmed by movement and that it's so funny because my son is so much like me in so many ways, his personality, his, you know, a lot of different things about him. But the difference that we have is that he craves vestibular movement. And like, I can't even spin around once without getting dizzy. Like I, I can't go any, any kitty roller coasters, roller coasters. Like I, I'm uncomfortable being a passenger in a car. Like movement for me is like, whoa, no way. It, I remember my cousins picking me up when I was little and trying to spin me around. And I'd be like, ah, like freak out because I couldn't handle being right. picked up and moved around. And my son is the opposite. 
he goes on like the scariest roller coasters, the faster, the scarier, the upside down and this and that, the better and water slides and everything. He loves it. He craves that movement. So it's so weird how we're exactly the opposite in that sense, but in all the other stuff, we're so similar. So that, <laughs> that, that I just thought was funny that um, yeah. you can, you can assume that things are a certain way, but then realize that, you know, you might have two kids and they're totally different. So everything is individualized to that specific person. Right. Right. And also, you know, over time, some, some kiddos, they're the way they process movement, you know, as, as kiddos change and grow and develop some, some, a little kiddo who might've been very fearful of their feet being off the ground because of their visual system, you know, kind of grows and shifts and develops and is now the roller coaster guru too. You know, like those things can shift and change over time. And and usually when things shift like that, I'm like, this is great. This, this, they're shifting. This is awesome. Things are, you know, things are happening. Um, but yeah, being aware of that too, that like, you know, as things are scaffolding, we're always attuning and always raising the bar, always raising the bar to um, continue to support one another, especially our kiddos, to maximize their developmental growth. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, this has been so wonderful speaking about all the different aspects of physical therapy. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you really wanted to throw in before we sign off that you can think of? The one thing about understanding how important movement is in impacting impacting the FEDCs, um, in that inverse way is that when kid, kiddos ha have to have some degree of a vestibular ocular gaze stability, they have to have some kind of capacity to, to emotionally signal an affect cue. And that relates to if they are really, really needing um, and seeking that movement, then we really need to support and, and put the movement piece at as a priority so that then that child can be able to affect you. It's kind of that, that concept of, of presuming that, that the kiddo is, wants to be in that joyful engaged state with us and, and they need a lot more movement in order to be able to do all that very rich preverbal affect signaling that we know is so important in FEDCs three and four in order to climb into the higher capacities for symbolic thinking and, and beyond. So that was the other piece I was just really wanting to focus on the importance of movement and getting the movement registered in that central nervous system in order to support the FEDCs. The functional emotional developmental capacities the developmental ladder that's talked about in DIR floor time I'll link to the post that describes them in um in the blog post as well the key is just remembering when even when your goals are for that motor development that you know we're taking into account everything um when we're supporting motor development i think that's really the key for me so thank and you. Uh, and that development happens so don't yeah. panic if your child isn't doing something at this particular age. Sometimes it comes a lot later than you think it's going to, but kids are developing. Right. And the pacing and the pacing that we can provide, especially when there is our challenges with motor planning cannot be underestimated at all. Just really, you know, grounding ourselves and, and trusting our instincts, um, you know, to really support and, and giving these kiddos the space and time to, to, to really generate their own development. So, yeah. Well, thank you. And listeners, viewers, you can look at the write-up from what we were talking about. I'll put links to some of the past podcasts and to Mary Beth's clinic in Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia at affectautism.com. Look up physical therapy and uh thank you so much mary beth it was awesome connecting with you thank you so much daria for this opportunity and it was great to, to talk to you this morning thank you season two of we chose play is here you can watch all six episodes of season one where we explore our journey from our son's birth through his diagnosis and learning floor time 
Then catch season two, where we go to the Floor Time Clinic, a total approach for intensives every year and receive guidance and therapies from occupational therapist Maud LaRue and her team into what's holding back our son's developmental potential. We chose play. You can see the preview on YouTube and you can register to watch the extended trailer for free at affectautism.com play or just go to wechoseplay.com. Until next time, here's to choosing play and experiencing joy every day. The Parent Support Drop-In is free, you can attend every week, and on May 2nd you can find out more about the Floor Time and Music course that we'll be offering.